In 1954, the United States Supreme Court ruled that segregation in public schools, the practice of having separate but equal schools for whites and blacks, was unconstitutional. This decision meant that schools had begun integrating students at all level levels. School children, particularly in southern United States, prepared to face the anger, hatred, and often violence of those who opposed this policy. In 1958, in the midst of this difficult time, R.B. Castle wrote this story called The First Day of School. As you read, play a close attention to the interactions of the Hawkins family and the clues that indicate what is significant about this first day of school. Thirteen bubbles floated in the milk. Their pearl transparent hemispheres gleamed like souvenirs of the summer days just past, rich with blue reflections of the sky and shadowy greens. John Hawkins jabbed the bubbles closest with him with a spoon and it disappeared without a ripple. On the white surface, there was no mark of where it had been. Stop to win the oatmeal and eat it, his mother said. She glanced meaningfully at the clock on the varnish cupboard. She nodded with a heavy, emphatic affirmation that now was the clock now the clock was boss. Summer was over when the gracious oncoming of morning light and the stir of easy breezes promised that this luxury time was a luxury. Audrey's not even down yet, he said. Audrey will be down. You think she's taking longer to dress because she wants to look nice today? She likes to look neat. What I was thinking, he said slowly, was that maybe she didn't feel like going today. Didn't feel exactly like it. Of course she'll go. I meant she might not want to go until tomorrow. Maybe. Until we see what happens. Nothing is going to happen, his mother said. I know there isn't, but what if it did? Again, John swirled the tip of his spoon into the milk. It was like writing on a surface that keep no mark. Eat and be quiet. Audrey's coming, so let's stop this here kind of talk. He heard the tap of his heels on the stairs and his sister came down into the kitchen. She looked fresh and cool in her white dress. Her lids looked heavy. She must have slept all right. And for this, John felt both envy and a faint resentment. He had not really slept since midnight. The heavy traffic in town, the long wheel of horns as someone raced in the U.S. highway holding their hold button down, and the restless murmur, like that sound of celebration down the courthouse square, had kept him awake after that. Each time a car had passed their house, his breath had gone tight and sluggish. It was better to stay awake and ready, he had told himself, than to be caught asleep. Daddy gone? Audrey asked softly as she took her place across the table from her brother. He's been gone an hour, their mother answered. You know what time he has to be at, to be at the mine. She means... Did he go to work today? John said. His voice had risen impatiently. He met his mother's stout gaze in the staring contest, trying to make her admit by at least some flicker of expression that today was different from any other day. I thought he might be down at Reverend Specker's, John said. Cal's father and Vonnie's and some of the others are going to be there to wait and see. Maybe his mother would smile then. If so, the smile was so faint that he could not be sure. You know your father isn't much of a hand for waiting, she said. Eat. It's a quarter past eight. As he spooned the warm oatmeal into his mouth, he heard the rain crow calling again from the trees beyond the railroad embankment. He had heard it since the first light came before dawn, and he had thought, maybe the bird knows what's going to rain after all. He hoped it would. They won't come out in the rain, he had thought. Not so many of them, at least. He could wear a raincoat. A raincoat might help him feel more protected on the walk to school. It would be sort of a disguise, at least. But since the dawn and the sun had lain across the green Kentucky trees and the roof of town like a clean, hard fire, the sky was as clear as fresh washed window glass. The rain crow was wrong about the weather. And still, John thought, its, laminating, it's lamenting, repeating call must mean something. His mother and Audrey were talking about the groceries she was going to bring when she came home from school at lunchtime. A five-pound bag of sugar, a fresh pineapple, a pound of butter. Listen, John said. Downtown the, siren, uh, downtown, the sound of a siren had begun. A volley of automobile horns broke around it as if they meant to drown it out. Listen to them. It's only the National Guard, I expect, his mother said calmly. They came in early this morning before light, and it may be some foolish kids honking at them the way they would. 
Audrey, if Henry doesn't have a good looking roast, why then let the but why then let it go? And I'll walk to Weaver's this afternoon and get one there. I wanted to have something a little bit special for dinner tonight. So, John thought, she wasn't asleep last night either. Someone had come stealthily to the house to bring his parents word about the National Guard. That meant they knew that others would come into town too. Maybe all through the night there would be a swift passage of messengers throughout the neighborhood and a whispering of information that his mother meant to keep from him. Your folks told you, he reflected bitterly, that nothing is better than knowing. Oh, went too far down. Sorry, guys. And we're back. Knowing whatever there is in this world to be known. That was why you had to be one of the half dozen kids out of some 900 colored of a school age who were going today to start classes at Joseph P. Gilmore High instead of Webster. Knowing and learning the truth were worth so much more than they said and then left a hooting rain crow to tell you that things were worse than any for everybody had hoped. Something had gone wrong, bad enough that the National Guard had to be called out. It's 825, his mother said. Did you get that snap sewn on right, Audrey? As her experienced fingers examined the shoulder of Audrey's desk, they lingered a moment in involuntary sheltered caress. It's all arranged, she told her children. How you'll walk down to the Baptist church and meet the others there. You'll know the, you know there will be Reverend Chatter, Reverend Smith, and Mr. Hall to go with you. It may be that the white ministers will go with you, or they might be waiting at the school. We don't know. But now you be sure, don't go farther than the Baptist church alone. Carefully, she lifted her hand, clear on Audrey's shoulder. John thought, why doesn't she hug her if that's what she wants to do? He pushed away from the table and went out to the front porch. The dazzling sunlight lay shadowless on the street that swept down toward the Baptist church at the end of the colored section. The street seemed awfully long this morning, the way that it had looked when he was little. A chicken was clucking contently behind their neighbor's house, feeling the warmth settling itself into the warm sun sun warm dust luckily lucky chicken he blinked at the sun's glare on the concrete steps leading down from the front porch he remembered something something else from the time he was little once he had kicked audrey's dull buggy down these same steps he had done it out of meanness for some silly reason he had been mad at her but as soon as the buggy had fallen started to bump down he understood how terrible it would it was to not be able to run after and stop it it had gathered speed at each step, and then when it hit the sidewalk, it had spilled all over. Audrey's doll had smashed into sharp little pieces on the sidewalk below. His mother had come out of the house to find him crying harder than Audrey. Now you know that when something gets out of your hands, it is in the devil's hands, his mother had explained to him. Did she expect him to forget now that he was always the way things I'm going to read that again. Did she expect him to forget now that that was always the way things went to smash when they got out of hand? Again, he heard the siren and the hooting, mocking hordes from the center of town. Did his mother think that they could get out of hand? He closed his eyes and it seemed to someone, something like a doll buggy bump. <laughs> he closed his eyes and seemed to see something like a doll buggy bump down long steps like the Joseph P. Gilmore High, and it seemed to him that it was not the doll that would be riding down to be smashed. He made up his mind then. He would go today because he had said he would. Therefore, he had to. But he wouldn't go unless Audrey stayed home. That was going to be his condition. His, par his bargaining looked perfect. He would trade them for one. His mother and Audrey came together onto the porch. His mother said, My stars, I forgot to give you the money for the groceries. She let the screen door bang as she swiftly back went back into the house. As soon as they were alone, he took Audrey's bare arm in his hand and pinched hard. You gotta stay home, he whispered. Don't you know there's thousands of people down there? Didn't you hear them coming in all night long? You slept, didn't you? All right, you can hear them now. Tell her you're sick. She won't expect you to go if you're sick. I'll knock if I'll knock you down. I'll smash you if you don't tell her that. He bared his teeth and twisted his nail into the skin of her arm. Hear them horns, he hissed. He forced her halfway to her knees with the strength of his fear and rage. They swayed there, locked for a minute. Her knee dropped to the front porch. She lowered her eyes. He thought he had won. 
but she was saying something in spite of himself, and he listened to her almost whispered refusal. Don't you know anything? Don't you know it's harder for them than us? Don't you know Daddy didn't go to the mine this morning? They laid him off on the count of us. They told him not to come if we went to school. Uncertainly, he relaxed his grip. How do you know all that? I listened, she said, her eye lit with a sudden spark that seemed to come from their absolute brow's depth. But I don't let on all I know the way you do. I'm not a... Her last word sunk so low that he could not exactly hear it. But if his ears missed it, he caught, his understanding caught it. He knew that she had said coward. He let her get up then. She was standing behind him, serene and prim, when his mother came out on the porch again. Here, child, their mother said to Audrey, counting the dollar bills in her hand. There are six, and I guess we'll be all right if you have some luck for you and your brother to get yourself a cone to look on the way home. John was not looking at his sister then. He was already turning to face the shadowless street, but he heard the unmistakable poised amusement of her voice when she said, Ma, don't you think we're a little too old for that? Yes, you are their mother said. Seems like I've had forgotten. They were too old to take each other's hand, either, as they were, they went down the steps of their home and into the street. As they turned to the right, facing the sun, they heard the chattering of a tank's tread on the pavement by the school. A voice too distant to be understood bawled a military command. There were horns again and a crescendo of booze. Crescendo of booze. Behind them, they heard their mother's call something. It was lost in the general racket. What? John called back to her. What? She had followed them out of the, uh, she had followed them out as far as the sidewalk, but not past the gate. As they hesitated to listen, she put her hands on either side of her mouth and called the words that she'd often used before they let go before she let them go away from home. Behave yourselves, she said.